Good evening and welcome. Hi. I'm Alicia Longwell. I'm the Lewis B. and Dorothy Cullman Chief Curator here at the museum. And it's my distinct pleasure to welcome you tonight to our ongoing series, Friday Nights Live. Uh, it's a very special night for me. We're gonna highlight one of the artists in our current exhibition, Affinities for Abstraction, Women Artists on Eastern Long Island, 1950 to 1920. Uh, that artist is Ruth Nivola. Uh, I had the absolute joy of knowing Ruth, um, maybe in the last 10 years of her life and to know what an extraordinary person and artist she was. And in um, organizing the exhibition, I hope to have uh, many well-known artists and then also maybe some artists that would be uh, a bit of a, a, a new, uh, not a surprise, but um, a new moment for people to discover. And I think that everyday visitors to the museum are really discovering Ruth Navola and her um, art. So uh, I wanna welcome everyone. Firstly, let me thank our sponsors, our presenting sponsor, Bank of America, also additional funding from the Corcoran Group and Sandy and Steve Pearlbinder. So as I said, to welcome tonight, I think three of the people who know uh, Ruth Nivola and her work probably best. And let me first uh, introduce Claire Nivola. And she's the daughter of uh, Costantino and Ruth Nivola, of course. And uh, I think, uh, Claire, you're about one year old when your parents bought the uh, old farmhouse out in Springs. And you talked about uh, growing up there and uh, being out with the uh, animals and, and nature and how much you loved it. You also uh, did mention that you, you sort of take, took art for granted as a child. It's not hard to imagine since both of your parents were so artistic and that it was like breathing or, or, or walking. It was very natural to, to you to go into this, uh, this field, shall we say. You are distinguished and internationally known author of children's books. You once wrote, um, illustrated a book, I think that Ruth wrote called The Messy Rabbit. <laughs> I don't know it, but I love the title. And you extremely um, have pointed out for all those who might think of writing for children, uh, it's a serious business. <laughs> and uh, uh, delighted to have you here uh, tonight, Claire. Um, let me next introduce Adrian Nivola. Uh, the grandson of the uh, Nivolas, uh, his father Pietro was their oldest child. And uh, you also grew up knowing uh, Tino and being in the studio with him and also your grandmother and knowing her work uh, so well. Uh, you are an artist as well. You're uh, based now in Bushwick, I think, uh, graduate of Yale uh, and the... Um, and the New York Studio School and uh, uh, extraordinary artist yourself, particularly the sculptures, which I love. Uh, so I'm thrilled to have you here. I know you were instrumental in preparing some of the sculptures for your grandfather's exhibition at Magazzino Italian Art, which leads me right into um, introducing uh, Dr. Teresa Kittler. She is the scholar in residence at Magazzino in Cold Spring, New York, just up the Hudson. Uh, not for much longer, you will return to uh, lecturing in modern and contemporary Italian art at York in the UK. Now you came really, I, I believe, to work on this exhibition. It's on currently, it's on uh, Nivola uh, Sandscapes, uh, the very wonderful uh, sand cast work that uh, Tino actually revived from you might say an ancient technique that he brought back and did so many extraordinary uh, designs and, and uh, sculptures in and reliefs. So this exhibition is, I haven't seen it. I can't wait to get there. It's up until January, but don't dawdle everyone. Make sure to put this on your list. Uh, I look forward to seeing it. So um, uh, Teresa has discovered 
in the research for the exhibition quite a good deal about Ruth and her work as well. So she's going to bring that aspect. So I want to turn this right over to the people that, uh, as I have said, know her and her work best. Claire? Okay. Thank, thank you, Alicia. Um, so I'm going to begin uh, by telling the, the um, basic facts of my mother's life up until the point where she started making um, the jewelry that Adrian and Teresa will then talk about. Um, she was born uh, Ruth Guggenheim, uh, January 12, 1917, in Munich, Germany, uh, a very assimilated uh, German Jewish family. Um, and at the age of six, um, uh, when uh, Hitler's beer Paul Putsch, it was a, an attempted coup, and it's the one that resulted in his imprisonment, where he also famously wrote Mein Kampf, um, had uh, alarmed my mother's father. Um, and he decided to take the family out of Germany. They went to Baden-Baden in the Black Forest of Germany uh, first to stay with his mother, who was um, elderly and eventually died. And then they went to Turin, where they had a villa um, looking out on the Alps. Um, and she went to the school for the first time to a convent school. Um, in the few years that they were away from Germany, um, at the age of about eight or nine, she was taken at one point to a spa in Mon at Monte Catini, where she contracted um, typhoid fever and was extremely ill and bedridden for a year, uh, had to learn how to walk again afterwards. Um, one of the notable things during that period that she remembered and that relate to her artwork um, was she remembered a nurse. Um, she was quarantined and could only see her mother and this nurse. And she remembered a nurse who would bring her these dried rhododendron leaves, which she would um, take two brushes and bang uh, the, the leaves with these brushes until the the dead leaf material fell out, but the filament of the veins of the leaf remained and this nurse would teach her how to embroider with silk threads uh, very painstakingly. And my mother said she would do this for hours. Um, my mother was famous for her patience, which you will also see in her work. I don't know if she learned it during that period or just had it innately. Um, in any case, in 19... Um, 27, uh, when the, the danger of, of uh, the Nazi uh, movement seemed to be over my grandfather, who was very um, German by culture. He loved German literature and music and philosophy. He really missed Germany. So he took the family back to Germany, where they settled in Frankfurt am Main. And um, my, they lived there until... Uh, and we can have the neck yep, until, I'm not sure what year this picture was taken, but let's say she's 16 or 17. And it's um, 1933, Hitler is elected to uh, power. And my mother in, at this point um, really picked up the scary vibes. Um, she felt it at school. There were all sorts of indications of anti Semitism. Um, I used to think 1933 was early, but it turns out plenty was going on by 1933 to scare anybody. So she became the sort of Cassandra of the family and wanted to leave again. Her father resisted, but she eventually prevailed. She, as she said, she would cry every night and until they, she got convinced her family to leave. Um, and they went back to Italy, which was a country that she already loved. She had an uncle there. They went to Milan um, and in, uh, she finished up her schooling. And then in 1935, she enrolled in an art school in uh, Monza near Milan. Um, it was called ISIA, which stands for, and I have to read this, the Istituto Superiore per le Industrie Artistiche. Um, it was an art school and uh, she was only able to go there one year because there were only three female students uh, the year that she was there, one of them, not her, got pregnant and the women were no longer allowed back the following year. So that was the end of her art education. But it had been time enough for her to fall madly in love with my father, um, who was also a student there. He was finishing his schooling there. Um, 
And uh, this was, she fell in love for life. I mean, she was in love with my father for the rest of her life um, and very romantic about it. Um, uh, she said about it that, about her mother who had studied um, unusually for that generation, her mother had, had studied uh, history of art at, at the university in Germany and had been very gifted as a student and her professor had encouraged her to follow in the field of art history. And my mother said, but, but love was stronger than talent, which is something one should keep in one's mind as we keep going here. Um, so um, she, she, now that she was out of school and her, my mother's parents had gotten wind of this, uh, in, not infatuation of this falling in love with this starving, literally starving student from the island of Sardinia. So a starving artist from a tiny village in an unknown island. They were not excited about it. They were, their last name was Guggenheim. They were not, I believe, of the, the Guggenheim family, but they were a wealthy family and they didn't think this was gonna work out. So they tried to dissuade my mother by sending her to um, work for the Olivetti uh, company in a, uh, a town um, called Ivrea, also not far from Milan. Uh, and she lasted about a few weeks before she was so heart sick, she had to come back. Um, the Olivetti's by the way, were um, the closest equivalent would be the ap apple. Um, they, they were, they made, People of my generation will remember typewriters and calculators. They actually invented the first computer, but they were run out of business by IBM. Um, they, they were very socially enlightened um, and they had beautiful design and, and had hired all the best artists and architects to work for them and so on. In any case, uh, my father, by the way, uh, ended up working for Olivetti and becoming the art director of their advertising. Uh, wing, but my mother, <laughs> who her parents were still trying to dissuade, um, was sent off for six months to fashion design school in Paris. Um, she was very, very um, aware of, of fashion and loved, she designed all her own clothes and so on. And um, uh, my father found a way to go to Paris. He had a cousin there. They saw each other in Paris. Anyhow, this was unstoppable. And by the time they came back, here we have them back in Milan, um, uh, either before they got married or right after. Um, and they, they um, continued their relationship. And then they, they got married quite hastily in 1938. Um, the rush was that they had heard from a friend that... Um, uh, Mussolini was about to pass racial, a new racial law that would not allow um, Jews and non-Jews to marry. So they quickly got married. Uh, this was when Hitler and Mussolini had just made their pact of steel and Mussolini was kind of getting in line with the anti-Semitic laws of Germany. Um, so uh, they, they got married and then soon after, I mean, next year, by the year later, they were um, leaving, trying to emigrate to America. And in 1939, they did come, they went through Paris. It was, uh, it's a long story, but my father had very uh, many friends who were anti-fascists. He was on a po Italian police list also. So my mother was Jewish. He was, uh, police in Italy were looking for him or his connections and so they made haste to get their papers in order and they came to New York City, to the port of New York in July, 1939. Um, when they got to New York, um, and we can stay on this picture for a moment, um, just because I don't have any picture of them first arriving in New York, um, they had very little, very little money. My father barely spoke English. Um, and they did all kinds of, they worked in a factory. My mother worked as a nanny. They did all kinds of things. My father painted, hand painted Christmas cards and took them to all the big department stores. In fact, that's how he was eventually hired as an art director uh, and for a magazine called Interiors. Um, it dealt a lot with the architecture. Uh, my mother during that period, um, Teresa, just one sec, we could go back for a second. Um, she, she worked for, um, a company called Phelps Leather. This is just another thing about her working with her hands. 
which made um, handbags and belts and designed them and made them. And she learned how to work leather incredibly well. We had, when I was a child, bags in the attic that purses that she had designed and made. Um, and we had her kit of leatherworking tools, which I found fascinating. It was a huge piece of leather with all these slots for all these different sort of medieval looking uh, tools. And she was a master leather worker. So um, now we can go on to family life. My father was able to earn a living and uh, my parents began making a, having a family. My brother um, shown their looking at me, well, I was born in 1944. I was born in 1947. This picture is taken probably in the very small apartment we had at 47 West 8th Street. It was a five floor walk up with no kitchen, just a closet that you opened up with a half refrigerator and you had to wash the dishes in the sink. Um, and um, in the next picture, you'll see the little family out um, in Long Island in the house that they bought in 1948 uh, when I was a year, year old. Um, and so then we go into, um, and Teresa, you can just um, start sh showing us. So this is another, this is gonna be the years of family life. So this is my mother out in the house in Long Island. Um, and uh, the first one, she's very elegant. This, I wanted to show this one as sort of, you can see her elegance. She probably designed that dress. And in the second one, you see our more primitive bohemian lifestyle where she's sitting by a, an oven that my father had built which was constructed the way they made bread ovens in Sardinia for the flatbread that they make that sort of balloons and you slit it. It's, a, it's an unleavened um, flatbread. The, mur the big mural behind the wall is by my father and is no longer there. Um, but the, the area with the oven is still at, at the house in Long Island. Um, then the next picture, this picture, um, I put in because it is, it's exactly the way I remember my mother as a child. In our first, my first six years, we lived all year round out at the house on Old Stone Highway. And then when I was six um, and the schools had proven to be pretty bad, the local school for my brother, they decided that we had to go to school in New York. But um, this is how I remember her, just incredibly sweet and domestic and cooking and pouring me a glass of milk. Um, and the next picture where, um, this is probably taken in the 1960s, again, a, just a, a sweet, docile, uh, she's like a, um, you know, wallflower of a wife devoted to the husband that she loved and to the children and the family and so on. Um, then the next slides, the point I want to make is that during this entire period that she was just a quote homemaker, she was always making things with her hands, with knitting and crocheting. Um, she made, uh, she mended every edge of every towel that came unraveled, rugs, she made elbow, crocheted elbow patches that we all wore when our sweaters wore down hats, berets, uh, tie, incredible ties for my father. Um, she designed and made my clothes. This is a sweater that she actually made for one of my children, but I had a sweater exactly like that at various stages in my life. So she made them for me at various, the same one from various stages. Uh, the earlier sweater was a baby sweater she gave my children. Then the following picture shows a a Pinocchio, um, you can see even its knees sort of imitate the joints by wood, the wooden joints of the legs. Um, this she made for one of my children. These um, she actually made later when she was already making her jewelry, it has the metallic threads, but these were finger puppets that she made for Christmas. She thought we could have Christmas shows with these finger puppets. This is a horseman and this is a sort of king. Um, and you can see the incredible ingenuity and how she could make just about anything that um, she could imagine. Um, the, the, there's some, a few more of just common objects. There's the snail, which she made for me, which I don't know how she could possibly have made that shell that spirals like that. The little basket she made when she came to visit me once she was much older, she couldn't stand not doing something with her hands. So she was sitting in my kitchen. She said, do you have any yarns? Do you have any crochet needles? And I had bought these colorful, beautiful yarns in Italy, not knowing how to crochet, but loving the yarns. And so I gave them to her. She just playfully made this little basket. The 
On the lower left are um, some pot holders that were, are so beautiful, I've never been able to use them. I, I just keep them as, as beautiful objects. Um, and the, then this, this was a rubber, pink rubber ball that she, I don't know how you crochet over a ball like this, but she did it. Um, I think it's amazing. Um, and uh, in the next slide, um, and I, I, this is what well, here she's already using the metallic yarns, but uh, I am going to trans start to transition here to uh, when she begins to make jewelry. And um, very typically of that of her generation, she waited until my, I was out of college. I was the younger child until I was not only in college, but finished with college. And then she probably had a, a moment of crisis thinking, what am I gonna do? And well, I know how to do these things with my hands. And she began playing uh, with what she could do and um, started making her jewelry. There's the next picture shows her basket. Uh, this is in her, in a bedroom in the house. You can see the metallic yarns, which by the way, she found in New York on one of those streets that specialized in one thing. It was specialized in costume uh, supplies and she managed to find these uh, metallic yarns. And, and it shows all the different colored um, silks and things that she also used. And um, the final picture um, is her, a picture taken of her um, during this period that she was working on her jewelry. And here, I'm going to hand it over to Adrian. Um. Claire, thank you. That was absolutely marvelous. And you set the stage beautifully for the, the, pre, the pre jewelry making years. I mean, just an extraordinary moment. Thank you. That's how I remember Ruth. Yes, yeah, that picture. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Claire. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, Adrian, I didn't mean to hop in there, but. <laughs> yeah, and I just wanted to to sort of complicate just one observation that Clara made, which is <clears throat> about her having um, seemed a wallflower of a wife at times, because by the time that I came on the scene, and she was an older lady at that point, and, and diminutive in stature, um, she was a force of nature, as I recall her. And she um, had this very, even though she was... Um, she had perhaps a shyness socially. She was without a doubt the powerful matriarch of our family. And um, Adrian, can I just say that's not a contradiction, it's a transformation. <laughs> right, right. Um, uh, so I now have, have uh, written down my remarks here, but I hope that um, none of you feel for a second that I'm not trying to speak as directly as possible to you. So please <laughs> bear with me, though I'm reading. Um, <clears throat> for as long as I can remember, my grandmother Ruth, or Bertie as we called her, liked to repeat a set of provocative questions in conversation. Is there beauty in the world or not? <laughs> Is there too much technology? Has art lost its way or not? Uh, she asked these absurd existential questions so often that eventually we couldn't help rolling our eyes. What was she up to? On the one hand, she never let go of the illusion that she could lead us into a lofty philosophical discussion, one through which she probably hoped to elevate my family out of our banal discourse, our default mode, which she referred to as toilet talk. <laughs> but it also seems to me that by so frequently voicing her doubts about the fate of beauty in the world, she was secretly summoning her own aesthetic will, affirming her values and her mission, that her questions were in fact a form of prayer. We all knew in any case that the answers in her mind were clear and uncomplicated and that what she longed for was not an intellectual debate, but for a resounding amen from the rest of us. There was, of course, no doubt in her mind that much too much technology was wreaking havoc on the world. Art, she was convinced, had lost its way for our culture no longer valued the pursuit of order, beauty and timelessness above chaos, ugliness, and fleeting fashions. 
Still, she maintained a lifelong faith that beauty stripped of cliche was an indispensable thing to create if one wanted to live well, and therefore even a moral responsibility. <clears throat> it is impossible to separate an appreciation for Ruth's art from an appreciation for how she lived, both of which are a testimony to her aesthetic resolve. As Dori Ashton once wrote in a review of her work, everything around Ruth bears the mark of an exceptionally delicate sensibility. In her home, the most common place utensils such as a soap dish or a bread basket bespeak the care and innate aesthetic, aesthetic will that Ruth Nivola brings to bear on her life. So in this brief talk, I wanna try and give you an idea of what inspired Ruth's marvelous works of art. I will focus not only on the specific sources, both ancient and contemporary from which she gleaned many of her ideas, but also on the attitude and values she stood for in her art, the specific delight she took in the creative process. I thought it might be best to begin by reading an eloquent introduction to Ruth's work for a show at the Zabriskie Gallery in 1986, um, written by Dori Ashton. Quote, Although Ruth Nivola studied painting, sculpture, and design at Italy's only vanguard art school at the time, her art was put into her life for many years as she raised her children and made a home for her prominent sculptor husband, Costantino Nivola. But some 15 years ago, she resumed her artistic life. She began, she began experimenting with colored and met metallic yarns, creating, weaving, and whipping utterly unconventional works that have come to be called adornments. They emerge from a desire to create images rather than the trivial wish to make pretty objects. That's the end of the quote. <clears throat> Um, <clears throat> Ruth was inspired by the art of a variety of ancient cultures. Her color sensibility, for example, was informed by the arrangements of pure pigments in Persian and Indian miniature painting. Her delicate line by structures depicted in Roman and Etruscan frescoes and the iconic power of her images as well as her rhythmic formal compositions by the art of her husband's ancient Sardinia. In her youth, she was especially struck by the aesthetic of the Sardinian peasants, whose costumes were elegantly designed down to the smallest buttons. Now, can we move to the first slide here? Um, that's an example of a Sardinian costume. The fine simplicity and the attention to detail impressed her and she felt her work was somehow akin in spirit to the Sardinian tradition in particular. But perhaps the most important source of inspiration was the flora and fauna of nature in her surroundings. Can I have the next slide? Ruth had a vast memory for images and often what she recalled of ancient art echoed in the structure of plants and trees, seeds, pods, twigs and flowers, which she loved to scrutinize at close range on a walk through the woods. So for example, the staccato rhythm of Sardinian buttons, can we go back to the previous slide for a second? Yeah. Um, suspended from a sleeve would be recalled in the similar visual rhythms of Lily of the Valley. In the affinity that she saw between archaic art and its mirror in nature, Ruth bridged all that she loved in the art of the old world with her experience of the new and found vital themes from which to invent her own lyrical shapes, forms, and images. Can I have the next slide? This work is entitled uh, Byzantine Seeds, and it's a title that my grandfather came up with, but I think it reveals the kinds of associations between both ancient and eternal natural phenomena that excited her, a, a visual link that she made at times consciously or subconsciously, uh, but which always expressed itself in her delight. To walk with Ruth in the woods was to witness someone in awe and ecstasy. The most childlike exuberance in an older person that I've ever encountered. 
she would pause by a pod or a stem and say, look at that. No, but really look at that. She saw the playful and the, the, the erotic in, in, in pine cones, pistons, and seed pods. She understood the rhythmic, lyrical, musical qualities in buds and berries, leaves and, and petals. She loved stems and the elegant bearing they gave a flower as though like long aristocratic necks or, or very slender figures. She understood their personalities and the meaning of their abstract qualities as clearly as one might read a portrait of a person. One of her fondest memories from which she derived continual inspiration for her work was uh, of playing in the black forest in the winter as a little girl. And she remembered the icicles which hung like crystalline stalactites from the pine trees and how magical that seemed to her, like ornaments on a cathedral. She remembered the feeling of being cradled in nature and under its protective aegis, the softness and stillness of the black forest, which was as silent as art itself and as visually awe-inspiring. And she wrote about this experience in her diaries. So now I'm gonna read you some passages uh, from her diaries. Um, uh, While I draw grasses, flowers, twigs, and leaves, I become aware of nature's subtle structures, her thoughtful formations. I am in awe of her gentle manner in obtaining her purpose. By drawing a flower, I get a glimpse of nature's tender yet inexorable process to shape, to do and undo, always concerned to restore balance where balance is lost. I look with amusement and wonder at the tiny insects which come to visit me here in my little studio in spite of the newly installed screens. What an extraordinary artist nature is. She knows that only a given shape can be married to a certain color, that a specific color or form calls for a certain movement or sound, that all the various elements that mold an insect have to interact in harmony. I am mesmerized by such subtle, intricate solutions. I try to understand and apply to my own work these small fragments of miracle. Um, so now I'd like to show at a clip some images of her work. Um, and next to them, I've, I've, I've juxtaposed examples of sources of inspiration. But I wanted to make clear that uh, the pairings I've put together are not intended to be taken too literally, as if to suggest that, that Ruth uh, made very specific references to a particular work of art or a particular form in nature. I, I think that would deny the work its mystery and originality. Um, I'm trying. I'm trying here only to to conjure Ruth's um, eye and how she made associations that that sparked ideas for her. So if we can go to the next um, next slide, okay. Now this one is called um, T Tears of Joy. I think, yeah, Joyful Tears. And, and, and you can see again the same theme of these cascading uh, seed-like forms. Can we go to the next one? These are uh, wisteria pods that we had a massive wisteria um, arbor outside of the house. And um, if you go to the next slide, you can see an affinity between those, uh, those seeds and the, the forms of, of this piece. Uh, next. Now here is a, a traditional Sardinian costume and I'd like to focus in on the beautiful uh, jewels just in the center of the chest of the model. And um, these were clearly meant to evoke the, the bosoms that are concealed behind the costume. Um, and if you go to the next slide, you can see how, uh, how Ruth sort of saw that uh, in, in, the, in the, the little acorns on the bottom left, or at least saw a similar um, theme in nature that's, that's, that resonates with the way that those two um, jewels in the costume were put together. And on the right, um, this is one of Ruth's inventions. I mean, it's a, it's, it has, I think, some um, 
evocation of the husks of a, of a seed or a pod. If we go to the next, but it also resonates with these early Etruscan jewels. Um, this was from the Etruscan Museum in Rome that she went to frequently in her youth. If we go next. To, uh, again, in that pendant in the middle, there's, I think, an affinity with that, um, with the same Sardinian, the jewel in the Sardinian costume, although, and, and also in its placement in the composition, um, though Ruth has added that beautiful orange, um, that sort of surprising note of orange there. Um, can we go to the next? Now, uh, this is a, a, a vase that, that Ruth owned and the kind of object that she liked to have around her house and that she would draw from. I wanted to show you the delicacy of her drawings and the way she observed um, the, the, the beautiful um, blades of grass and wheat. Next, this is Queen Anne's lace, her drawings of Queen Anne's lace. And next, hope I'm not going too fast here. Tell me if I'm good. Um, and so uh, she saw obviously this, the, the musical quali lyrical qualities in all of these natural forms, but that led her to, to an interest in musical instruments themselves. And I think she liked the images of these instruments. They're sort of iconic presence. If we go to the next. Um, and again, the next. So these are drawings of instruments that she made studies of. This, um, I wanted to point out actually that she never realized this drawing. It's, it looks like a preparatory sketch for an idea for a, a jewel, but she didn't, she didn't realize this. And I think perhaps the reason was because she might've found it a little too literal. But if you go to the next slide, you can see how here so beautifully and poetically she translated musical ideas into that beautiful legato um, flow of the blue lines in that piece, the sweep of that. It has almost the sound of music in it. Um, if we go to the next. And um, I think this is called a uh, circus necklace. Go to the next. And African queen. Next. Uh, oh, this is dragonfly. Lover's Rope. Here I've put paired together a, a, a fragment from an ancient Pompeian fresco that's at the Metropolitan Museum with uh, one of her compositions. And I think you can see just how sort of innate in her were the, the intervals, the linear, the relationship of horizontal to vertical, um, the proportions feel to me very evocative of that ancient Roman art. And again, another piece in that sort of Pompeian vein. This is called Achilles harp. And next, um, clouds anchor. Keys of miracle. <laughs> Gabriel's scale. Now this I wanted to pause on just briefly because um, I think this was one of her favorite pieces. Um, and she had it in her bedroom all throughout my childhood. And she used to say that it, um, that she say about it, uh, that, well, that's like my mother, my mother was that way, you know. So this piece I think we can be, be, be you know, shows how some of her work for her could evoke a presence like a portrait, uh, the way a portrait might be very specific to the character of, um, of, of, a, of a specific personality. And um, whereas some of her work seems so clearly to, uh, to reference the body and to focus on its relationship to the figure and the proportions of the figure, in fact, would seem to require the figure in order to make sense. These um, works like this have a, a, a special autonomy that sets them apart, I think, um, where they're, they're independent compositions of the body. Um, and let's go to the next, uh, yeah. Uh, this is called, 
I can't, uh, blessing, I suppose. And then the next piece too. Etruscan choker. And the final piece, Queen B. This was a very, uh, a piece that I think uh, traveled quite a bit and um, on ex in exhibitions internationally. But if we go to the next slide, you can see here is Ruth in the middle of um, the photograph um, adorning her model on with one of the pieces. And you can see how beautifully it relates to her figure there. Um, let's go to the next slide. Um, so um, just to show how a dynamic and, and kind of um, nuanced her project was, uh, there, were, there were other ideas that began to enter into the jewelry uh, where Ruth um, would change the scale of the relationship of, of, of the jewelry to a person. And here, you can see on the drawing on the right that the jewelry almost becomes a tree that the that the that a person is seated under, um, and this led her to this kind of shift in scale or this idea about how to play with scale. Let's go to the next slide. Led her to um, experiment with trying to create almost environments out of her jewelry, rooms that were full of the the various pieces of her jewelry, which I think. Um, as you, you, you would enter into almost uh, projecting yourself into these spaces and environments, these worlds, uh, and shrink yourself down to wander through them. They have a, 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 a relationship to surrealist works, to Miro, I think, um, and maybe early Rothko. Um, so let's go to the next slide. These are more ideas for how to present them in these environments as worlds. And the next. This is the final slide I have, but it, this is a realized um, piece that those sketches were helping to inform. And um, I thought I would end on just one last quote of hers uh, that says a lot about her, the care with which she made her work. Um, she wrote, I noticed distinctly that one tiny stitch more or less will make the difference between a good and a bad result. Ergo, one small stitch determines the outcome of the whole. Perhaps it is the same with the world. One single human being lost in the billions will shape the spirit of the time, possibly the future. So with that, I would like to turn it over to Teresa. Thank you. Uh Adrian, thank you. It's Alicia. That was an absolute visual delight and, and from the heart and so many affinities that you, your work has with your grandmothers and what a treat. Thank you so much. All right, Teresa. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I encountered Ruth only very recently uh, while researching the work of Constantino Nibala, but I found myself thinking about her on several occasions, um, intrigued by the glimpses into her life her work, her personality that were offered in conversations with Claire, with Adrian and those close to her. Intrigued also by something that Tina had said in interview, one conducted in the 1980s towards the very end of his life, when he was asked to talk about the work that Ruth had been making. Tina's eyes light up and smiling to himself as if to reveal a long held family secret says of Ruth, it's our conviction, mine and Claire's, that she is the artist in the house. I didn't get the chance to see Ruth's work in person until about a month or so ago. And with that, the opportunity to look through the archive she had amassed uh, carefully, you see her here with her boxes, a stack of magazines and newspaper clippings of her work, um, but also of work that inspired her copies of publications, archival boxes of her neatly kept jewels and drawings to accompany each of these all labeled and annotated. And I suppose what I was most struck by as I looked through the various documents was just how much interest and excitement her work generated in a relatively short space of time. And I just want to briefly share some of the material I found um, 
So within a year or so that she started making her work, a small collection of these was exhibited at the Benson Gallery in Bridgehampton in the summer of 71, and the show virtually sold out. Gallerists and curators were clamoring to include her work, attested to in the letters and invitations that she kept. A Tokyo-based gallerist planning an exhibition of modern American jewelry in the latter half of the 70s writes, you are suggested to us as one of the most remarkable jewelry designers of today's America. The exhibition was the first of its kind in Japan and um, to which Ruth lent three works, um, but this is by no means the only instance of um, this kind of thing. The originality and uniqueness of Ruth's work is conveyed by a commentator who describes it as the most innovative since Ibram Lasso's pendants appeared more than 30 years prior. But this is more than mere flattery. It's also borne out by the number of shows uh, to which she participated, including in a major touring exhibition highlighting excellence in American craft that was organized by the American Craft Museum and that traveled across the USA, Europe, Russia, and Turkey and was universally received with acclaim and breaking attendance records wherever it was shown. She was involved in innovative curatorial projects, the education program titled Your Portable Museum, a slideshow of her work for wide circulation, featured in leading periodicals and included in publications about contemporary jewelry. For example, American Crafts book, or Alice Spinston's A Jeweler's Art. Her work, and here another early example, seemed to capture the imagination of many and the qualities that have been highlighted by Adrian were widely recognized. Emphasis was placed on her inventive handling of alternative materials, on the intricacy of her workmanship, on Ruth's ability to make something precious out of what is intrinsically not through workmanship and design. Critics praised her ability to marry the modern and the pre-modern and a range of ancient references were invoked as her work was imagined worn by Cleopatra's friends, Empress Theodora Ravenna, among other illustrious names. Or for example, in the exhibition publication uh, accompanying her show in Sardinia, Giocaglia, in which Ruth's work is imagined adorning Piero della Francesca's Madonna of Senigalia, and the same work, uh, Queen Bees, uh, reimagined on a contemporary model for the exhibition at, at the Zabriskie Gallery. I think the attention she enjoyed can be partly accounted for by the fast growing popularity and professionalism that fiber art, for want of a better term, was experiencing when Ruth started making her work. But if we think back to an exhibition of just uh, a couple of years earlier, such as Wall Hangings, uh, 1969 exhibition held at MoMA, which the art historian Elisa Alta has carefully examined, it received very little attention in the press and one mixed review by the artist Louise Bourgeois. The criticism raised by Bourgeois aligned uh, craft or applied art as the works on display were referred to, works by Annie Albers, Gunther Stoltz, amongst other well-known names with decoration. And with that association, she dealt a kind of kiss of death to the curators of the show. To pull back a little, Bourgeois was trading on the pejorative associations that the term decoration carried uh, within the 20th century. The critic of modern art, Clement Greenberg, famously spoke of it as the spectre that haunts modernism and had tried hard to excise it. The term for him signaled a sort of shorthand for the superficial treatment of surface, but also perhaps more surprisingly with skilled labor, with precision in a mechanical rather than felt out manner of working. And these associations have a longer history and attempts to position painting and sculpture as a liberal and not mechanical art, where it's readily coupled with terms like usefulness, adherence to traditional form, the use of lesser media. Material distinctions are important here and 
fiber or work made with fiber or th thread firmly positioned it as craft rather than art. Ruth also appeared sensitive to the term decorative and this echoes something that Adrian has already mentioned in response to an invitation to contribute to one of a kind American art jewelry, Ruth makes a clear distinction when she says, I search therefore for the true meaning of beauty, not decorative beautification. And I try to convey this through my work, even if I don't always succeed. The term craft was much maligned, but not always in a consistent way. Um, it's also been allied with an idea of femininity which bestows on the term a sense of frivolity rather than skill here, with the implication that it was something somehow less serious or unable to grapple with intellectual or abstract, abstract questions. Ruth's own interest in making sculptural jewelry coincides with a generation of artists, curators and critics who had sought to reevaluate the status of craft and question that well-worn dichotomy between fine and applied arts. And it also coincides with a moment when artists inspired by feminism found a means of expression through textiles and quilt making. The responses to this problem came in different forms, valorizing, avoiding, challenging the terms. And these individual responses have also shaped the way in which Ruth's work was met by different critics. So, for example, there are a wide variety of terms that get used in relation to Ruth's work, which also determines to an extent the way in which they have been perceived. We see that the anxiety over terminology persists, perhaps even much later than we might expect it to. In a review for the East Hampton Star from 1997, Patsy Southgate notes that the drive to adornment is as basic as the will to art, and yet the term is so little understood and so trivialized by many critics. And there's a clear desire on the part of this critic to elevate the term. She notes that it reaches new heights of imaginative power in the work of Ruth Nivala. It reveals a tactile intelligence and a zest for materials. I've seen Ruth refer to her work as my ornaments, but I've also come across terms such as structures or combined with sculpture and hyphenated. So sculpture as jewelry, as sculpture, or even simply body sculptures in a review of work at the Boston Institute of Contemporary Art. The review talks about Ruth's body sculptures and those of her contemporaries as mobile art exhibits. Other critics simply called for an expanded or stretched definition of jewelry. And of course, uh, the presentation of her work in boxes changes the tenor altogether, reframed as striking a delicate balance between sculpture and drawing. What characterizes Ruth's attitude to uh, this question is her unreserved valorization of the role of the artisanal or of craft something uh, that's also close to the heart of the recent history of Italian art, if we think of a movement like Arte Povera or Italy's history of design. In a letter to the founders of the publishing house Elisso on the occasion of her exhibition in Sardinia, Ruth offers feedback on a text written about her work by the artist and curator Mirella Bentivoglio. I don't consider myself an artist, but an artisan. So comparing me to Paul Clay seems a little bit of an exaggeration. One of the effects of this attitude to making work has been to raise the question of the value of labor involved in her production. And as has been mentioned, she's, she has a relatively small body of work and her works were complex and time consuming to make many months, sometimes more. I don't think I could ask what they are worth, she writes. And if I put a reasonable price on them, I'd be getting the wages of, oh, a cleaning woman. Jean Lippmann Block articulated the problem more broadly. 
Ruth Nivala confronted one of the basic dilemmas of the craftsman in today's marketplace. She has invented a totally new kind of craft jewelry, each piece marked with the wit, originality and exquisite taste of its creator. This was no accident for she had made each piece herself, the result of many hours of detailed painstaking effort. Not surprisingly, the public responded favorably Exhibited pieces were sold and initial early orders filled. But what is supposed to happen next? There are only so many hours a day during which a single human being can devote hands and eyes to intricate crocheting. One woman's output is not sufficient. Besides, the artist's need is to explore, not to retrace. Cottage industry methods have not worked. Defeated by high costs and lack of skilled practitioners, Mass production is hardly a solution because then the artist is delivered up entirely to the enemy in a world already awash in meaningless multiples stamped out by the automated cookie cutters of industry. These problems identified by Ruth and reiterated by her loyal critics are long-standing ones and it brings to my mind some of the challenges faced by other artists that have been invested in marrying art and craft. So, for example, although Walter Gropius's initial aim for the Bauhaus was a unification of the arts through craft, aspects of this approach proved financially impractical. While maintaining the emphasis on craft, he had to reposition the goal of the Bauhaus in 1923, stressing the importance of designing for mass production. And it was at that time that the school adopted the slogan, art into industry. Or before that, a figure like William Morris, whose socialist ideals rubbed against the prohibitively expensive costs of pr production for many. I want to make a final point, and uh, it's something that both Claire and Adrian have touched on, her desire to put her life as mother, wife, her devotion to her husband first was a great source of pride, as I've understood it. And in many ways, it goes against the grain of certain shifts in attitude of artists inspired by feminism, though I don't wish to oversimplify this point either, as there were many feminist writers, Silvia Federici, just one of them, that were motivated by a desire to valorize the labor of the home. But there's something about Ruth's attitude that seems to accept that one's energies need to be directed in a certain um, and perhaps in an exclusive way. Ruth was making work at a time when the tide was starting to turn in relation to the perceived challenges faced by women artists, or when at least the recognition that many women artists had played second fiddle to their partners, willingly or not. Um, but more broadly, at a time when the general failure to include women in exhibitions was starting to be redressed. Bernice Steinbaum was one of a generation of critics that sought to draw attention to this problem. A rare gallerist at the time who had a 50-50 representation of artists. And her Crossing the Threshold exhibition that um, opened in 1997, another big touring show to which Ruth participated with the work that you see in this slide, paid tribute to what the curators described as the quote, genius and tenacity of 31 women, ranging in age from 70 to 105, who have persevered since the early half of the century to establish their names as artists. The number, a nod to Peggy Guggenheim's groundbreaking 31 women artist show held in 1943. Icons of feminist art practice, such as Miriam Shapiro, appear alongside artists associated with abstraction, expressionism, and otherwise, Helen Frankenthaler or Agnes Martin. And despite Ruth's perhaps traditional views in relation to family life, she's positioned as something of a role model um, in the eyes of the curators for a younger generation of artists, uh, described as a remarkable benchmark and inspiration, suggesting to pass the words of one of the reviewers of the show, that there's no right time to retire, no limits of gender and no forgetting what treasures we have among us. And that's the end of mine. Thank you. Thank you so much, Teresa, for giving 
us that historical context to uh, Ruth's work as well. Um, what a what a trifecta, my friends. <laughs> Thank well, you so much. Alicia, and, I just yeah. want to finish up. Yes, yeah, please do. <laughs> with the last picture, as uh, one thing we haven't said, I don't think to any of us is that she only made these jewelry, this jewelry for if we can call it that, it's questionable what it should really be called, um, uh, for 15 years from after I, I graduated from college until May 5th, 1988, when my father died of a heart attack. Uh, at that point, she simply stopped making her jewelry. Um, she claimed that she could only make, he was her inspiration and she made it for him. Um, it's true that he loved it and he named all of them with those wonderful titles. Um, but she just stopped and never went back to it and instead became the kind of Yoko Ono of, of, of Costantino Nivola as she spent another 20 years within. And, and, and this is where I said in the beginning about Adrian, it was a transformation. Um, she became a very, very, um, she came out into the world. Uh, she was wheeling and dealing with Italy. She set up a museum in his hometown. She had several large art books published in Italy about him. Um, she was treated with great respect and reverence by Italians. And she was always on the phone with them at five in the morning, waking everybody up. And she was a, a whirlwind of, um, and became, I think quite, and even though it's, Tragic to me that she gave up her jewelry. She led an entirely, uh, she explored a whole other side of herself, much more outgoing and in the world. Um, uh, one last thing I want to say that bears on some of the things Teresa said is that I did not, Teresa went through this box of articles and reviews. I, I as her daughter, did not know that her work had been so acclaimed, that she'd had so many shows. She, she uh, maybe I didn't listen when she told me, but I doubt it. I don't think she ever talked about it when we came home. We were the focus. Uh, she wasn't going off to her studio to, to work, even if it was in those years. Um, she, she, she wanted to um, be known as the, the, the mother and the wife of a man she loved and um, the, uh, she, she just kept that pretty hidden. But the interesting thing is that she kept a box with all that record uh, and there's the ambiguity. So that's the end. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Adrian, Teresa, any closing remarks? I think we could... Um... I'm I think I've said everything I wanted to say. <laughs> yeah. I think we all can all go into this evening with a much more uh, complete picture of uh, Ruth as an artist, as a woman, as a um, grandmother, as an extraordinary person. So, and everyone, please come see the works at the parish that are on view in, in uh, the Affinities for Abstraction exhibition and Teresa's beautiful exhibition at Magazine 02, which uh, very much about her life together with uh, Costantino. All right, thank you all. This was wonderful, absolutely wonderful. Good night. Good night.